his life for mine. Does that stir your soul this morning? Does that, does that have any meaning in your heart? Turn in your Bibles, please, to John chapter 20. While you turn there, I do want to make an announcement about the Easter carnival that we had yesterday here on this property. And we, uh, we had 176 children that uh, registered. And that is, that is like a great, great day. And uh, Rakita and all her workers that helped and every person that ran a booth that, that helped out wherever they helped out, because uh, there's a lot going on. We had a blood drive yesterday also, and that went really great. But uh, uh, thank you so much for everybody that made it happen. Those of you that brought candy in, those of you that did anything, uh, you know, with this going on yesterday, uh, thank you so much. It was a great success, and uh, we had 176 registered children. Uh, Rakita says, I know that we had way over 200 because a lot of our own kids didn't register, which makes sense, our own Clover Hill kids. So um, anyway, but thank you to Rakita, who does a great, great job uh, with our children's ministry. And, uh, and the day that they put on yesterday, uh, job well done, well done. This morning, the title of the sermon is When Hope Filled an Empty Tomb. When Hope filled an empty tomb tomb generally when something is empty uh, generally that can be you know not a good thing um how many of you have ever if you look who's not afraid to admit that you've ran out of gas before in your vehicle okay i'm gonna stick my hand up it happened to me one time it happened to me twice my first and my last <laughs> it happened one time up in indiana and i thought and, and look, and I broke down right in front of the place where the college where I worked, right in front. You couldn't have been any more in front. And of course, I felt like such an idiot. And, and uh, uh, not that I think you are, if you've ever ran out of fuel. That's just the way I felt about me. Anyway, so generally, you know, things, things that are empty can be bad. Bank accounts that are in me, in, in empty, it's not a good thing. You know, when there's no money occupying your bank account, that can be difficult. Uh, the cupboard, the refrigerator, you know, when those things are empty, not a good thing. When our minds are empty, you know, and, 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 and we don't have control of our minds, not a good thing. Uh, the idle mind is the devil's workshop even, and that's a, that's a great saying there. But I'll tell you about another time when, uh, <clears throat> when being empty was not a good thing. When I worked at the college, and even as a student, we would train, we would train, you know, we all carried firearms, sidearms, and, and we would train with paintballs, paintball warfare, we, we called it training. <laughs> we, we, it was excused as training, but we would train in our buildings. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and the truth is of it is that was a lot of play, but there was actually some good being accomplished, too. Well, the, the guns that we used, the paintball guns that we used, you know, was a CO2-powered paintball gun, shot a paint, a pellet out about that size. And, and um, I remember one time that we were training, and, and I was on, you know, in this particular scenario, I was part of a group that was trying to get into the buildings, so I had the great idea, I'm going to climb up on the roof, you know, I, you know, being on security there, we knew how to get everywhere. So I knew how to get up on the roof and I was going to jump down into the inner courtyard, the inner courtyard, and then come in that way into the building. And I knew that a friend of mine, uh, his name was Greg Ewing, and uh, he was just in the hallway, just inside the inner courtyard, but he had his back to the door that led out into the inner courtyard where I was going to be jumping into, and I was going to come up there and just shoot him, just shoot him right in the back. Uh, all's fair in love and war, they say. Well, and because he was looking into this room, all right, at somebody else. Well, I jump off, and, 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 it, and it was about a, it was about a, I don't know, eight to ten foot drop. It's not that far. And I jumped off, and when I hit, my gun slammed on the ground. But uh, generally when a CO2 blows, you hear it as the gas leaks away. But I didn't hear that, so I thought, well, I'm, I'm in good shape. 
So I, I worked my way around, and, and, and where the door was, it was a big glass, big, prob probably 20 foot of glass, then the glass door. And I peeked around, and I saw Greg standing there, and I, so I came up the stone steps, and I had my gun, and now I'm in the doorway, and he's like 15 feet away right there, and I'm like, this guy is going down right now. And so I get in my isosceles firing stance, uh, um, and, and, and I leveled off at him, bend my knees a little bit, good form, good stance, and I put my finger on the trigger and click. Nothing happened. And here's what he does. His back's to me. He hears a click and he goes, he's still not looking at me. And so now I'm not moving. I'm just standing there with an empty gun. And all of a sudden he does one of these. Then he turns. And I'm not moving because I don't want to cause any motion that he could catch out of his peripheral vision. And then he looks straight at me. And of course, he doesn't know what's going on. You know, he jumps, and I think he screamed. I'm not sure. I just laughed and took off running. He came over to the door, if I remember correctly, and just shot me in the back. So there you go. You, you reap what you sow, kind of like Haman getting hung on the gallows that he built. That's not a good thing, is to, is to, is to have a firearm, you know, in your hand and for it to be empty. But... There was time, there was a time almost 2,000 years ago when something being empty had the greatest impact on mankind. There are things in life that are absolutely powerful when empty, and the one that we're going to talk about today is the empty tomb. Generally, we look at something being empty and think, I need to go get more. I need to fill this up. I, there, there needs to be a presence of whatever I'm looking for. It needs to be in there. In this case, being empty was the greatest thing that could have happened that morning. Look at verse 1 of John chapter 20. Let me ask you, do you need the lights on a little bit? If you do, okay, we got them there. Good. Verse 1, John 20, verse 1. And the first day of the week cometh Mary... Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and, and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter. And came first to the sepulcher, and, stu and he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lying. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And see it, two angels in white sitting, the one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And <laughs> that's a typical statement, isn't it? Guys, how many times have you looked at your wife and said, what are you crying about? <laughs> Pretty much what happened here. She saith unto them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seeketh thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him thence, hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to be, which is to say, Master. Verse 17, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended. To my father, but go to my brethren, and or, but go to my brethren and say unto him, them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that He had spoken these things unto her. What does the resurrection mean to you today? What does Easter mean to you today? 
when you think of Easter, do you think, look, do you think of, of Easter bunnies? Do you think of Easter baskets? Do you think of Easter egg hunts? Do you think of coloring Easter eggs? Do you think of chocolate bunnies? Do you think of candy? Do you think, are these the things that, that first pop into your head? Or do you think of the resurrection? Do you think of the empty tomb? What enters your mind first? As a child, it's, it's generally speaking, it's the other things. And look, and I don't have any problem, you know, with those things. As long as they have their proper place. And as long as they, they, they come, they, they're in second place by a long shot. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ mean to you today? Easter is Easter because Jesus had an, it has, has continually an irresistible love for each and every one of us. For the unsaved this morning, if you say, I'm without Christ, if you say, there's never been a time in my life where I knew that my sins, that I was a sinner, there was a penalty upon my sin, that penalty is death and eternal separation from God in a place called hell. But Jesus, that's the purpose for which he was born, was to live on this earth. He lived 33 years. He died for my sins. And God says, somebody's got to be punished. Somebody has to pay for breaking the law. And Jesus says, I will take that punishment. And that was the plan of God and God's plan. Jesus executed it, went to the cross. He died for our sins. And then three days later, he rose again, showing that death could not keep him down, that he had power over death for all believers. But if you're here without Christ this morning, You've never received him as your savior. You've never said, come into my heart and save me. I receive you today as my Lord and savior. Forgive me of my sins. I trust you as my only hope for heaven. That is the work that God seeks to do in your life this morning. Without a doubt, without a doubt. If you're here today and you are a believer, you remember that day that you got saved. But maybe you've, Maybe the first thing that enters your mind when you think of Easter is what, what am I going to plan for dinner? And maybe what am I going to, you know, how, how, what am I going to do for the children? If those are the first things, and maybe God is trying to, in your life this morning, maybe he's trying to light a new fire. Maybe he's trying to bring revival to your own heart this morning. As he seeks to draw you closer to him. Does an empty tomb have any value in your heart today? You know it happened. It happened. There was, you ought know, to sit down and do some research sometime. It's not just this thing that Christians believe. Now this happened. There is historical evidence. Jesus didn't just appear to to the disciples. The Bible states, and I think the number is, that it says that he appeared to over 500 people after he rose again. There is historical evidence. Now, people that, 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 that reject Christ and spend their lives trying to get everyone around them to reject Christ will never tell you that. The world's view is often like this. What is up with those Christian people? They live in some alternate reality. It's not reality where they live. No, the opposite is exactly true. We live in reality. And everyone that doesn't recognize Jesus as the, the hope and the savior of this world is living a lie. But they will tell you they're living in another reality. They don't think like we do. They don't act like we do. Christians, they don't laugh like, they don't think the same things are funny that we think are. Uh, they don't hate like we do. Uh, they don't invest like we do. The things, they don't prioritize like we do. They get up on a Sunday morning, they grab their Bible and out the door and I'm just waking up and they're going off to church. I don't understand those people. They don't do anything like we, yet, yet, 
they have found something that is worth dying for. We can kill them, and there's still people being martyred today, but I'm really referring now to the people in the Bible. We can kill them, they said in the book of Acts. But they keep on serving and preaching the message that Jesus saves. They speak of suffering like it's some kind of an honor to be persecuted for this Jesus person. And Paul and the apostles counted it an honor to suffer for the cause of Christ. That's the world's view. The historical view can be described in this quote made by a, a, an American historian named Paula Fredrickson. She said this, an unbeliever, here's what she said though, I know in their own terms, speaking of the disciples, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say. And then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attest to their conviction that that's what they saw. She says, I'm not saying that they really saw the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. She said, I don't know what they saw. But I do know that as a historian that they must have seen something. Now, that's an unsaved historian saying, look, I wasn't there. I don't have a clue. There is, there is historical evidence that he was raised, but I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but I know this. They saw something. They saw something. Now, get this. The terrified disciples. Now, think about that. The disciples, as he was arrested, they were ready to fight. Peter was ready to go to battle. And Jesus says, you put your weapons away. Cut a guy's ear off. Jesus puts it on and he says, stand down. Peter, stand down. This has to happen. So he gets arrested, unfairly accused, unfairly judged, beaten, and, and I'm not going to go into all that for, sake, for, for time's sake this morning, but beaten and pummeled that at the end of his, his beating and the scourging and the things they did as they wore the, the crown of thorns upon his head, the Bible says that he was so cut up from the lashings of all over his body and that his face was so swollen that he didn't even look like a man. That's what God's word says. As this happens, the disciples didn't... Look, they weren't all in a, in a group over here, you know, just taking this in and saying, well, this is going to happen. And, and no, look, they dispersed. As Nate would say, they were gone. They went into the recesses of the crowd and just kind of melted back into the crowd like, we don't understand what's going on here. He's the son of God. How can this be happening? Even though he had told them this was going to happen, they didn't, they didn't see it. And they, they just melted into the crowd. Peter, Peter, the, the worst, God recorded his actions as having denied Christ three times. You know who Jesus says? Nope. That guy right there, you don't know who he is? Never seen him before. Once, and Jesus predicted this. Next time, surely we, we think you're one of the disciples, one of them that followed him. No, nope, I'm not. And then the third time they came up and somebody says, I know you're one of them. And what did he do? He cursed. I'm not one of them blankety, blankety, blank, 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 blank people. I'm telling you, I'm not one of them. I don't think that he was the only one that died. I can't prove that. That was the one that God used as an illustration. But I believe that the rest of them just melted because you don't read of them anywhere. You see John. John, John was, was there at the cross, but you don't see the others. And they may have been at the cross, but they weren't sticking their head up as a disciple and a follower of Jesus Christ. They were terrified at what was happening. The Savior, the Son of God, is now on a cross and he's naked and and he's bleeding. He's dying. He's been nailed. He's been nailed to the cross. 
terrified people. But those terrified people became the same people that started the New Testament church 50 days later. Why? Why? The same terrified ones that cursed, denied him, that walked away and said, oh, I don't even want to be identified with him. I'm afraid of what's going to happen to me. If it ended right there, it ends right there. Right? It ends right there. There's nothing more to the story. The closest people that he pulled to himself and said, I'm going to use you to turn this world upside down. And you're going to start what's called the church. You're going to establish it. It would have ended right there, but it didn't. Something turned these terrified men and these followers of Jesus, something turned them around on a dime. But what was it? They saw Jesus, it was the resurrection. They saw Jesus. These same men that, that, that re rejected the knowledge of him, cursed and, 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 and uh, you know, pulled back at the cross, were the same men that later went around the, the world, taking the gospel to the known world, look, and being persecuted and being killed. And all of them died as martyrs, save John. They tried to kill the apostle John. What changed them? The resurrection. They saw something. And this unsaved historian here is exactly right when she says, I wasn't there, I, so I can't say firsthand what they saw, but I know this, they saw something. And it was a resurrection. Jesus' own brothers and sisters did not trust him till they saw the resurrected Jesus. They saw something. And their lives were turned around. And that something they saw was Jesus risen from the dead. Fifty days later, the Holy Spirit comes and, and, and is given to Christians. And they go out and, and just proclaim fiercely, powerfully, working now as apostles and doing miracles. And not just the apostles, but other believers. Stephen, one of the first deacons in the church, preaching, winning souls to Christ. It's on people, uh, 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 healing people because of a risen Christ. The disciples went from, they were ready to fight for him before the, before the cross. They fled from him when he was on the cross. And then they came back to him as a risen Savior to never turn back again. To never turn back again. The blessings of an empty tomb. Let me give you a few things <clears throat> that the empty tomb was filled with on that great day. Initially, Mary saw an empty tomb, right? Generally, when you see something empty, it's a bad thing. And even Mary said, this troubles me. They've taken his body. But listen, the greatest truth in the world and the greatest thing that happened in the history is the fact that Jesus wasn't in that tomb. If he's still there, Mary looks in, and well, if, if he's still there, the stone's still there. But say they roll the stone away, she walks in. If he's still there, that is probably a comforting thing to her heart. Well, there's my Savior. There's his body. We're going to take it and get it ready. Uh, get it ready, and we're going to, you, you know. But the, the greatest thing that could have happened that day, which blew her mind, was she walks in, looks in, and he's not there. It was empty. It was empty of the Savior's physical body, but it was filled with hope. An empty tomb was not empty. It was filled that day with hope. With hope. If Jesus was still laying there, where's our hope? John 10, 10 says, the thief, come, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have what? Life 
and that they might have it more abundantly. Super life. Amen. Through Jesus Christ. The hope of that abundant life filled the empty tomb that day. It wasn't an empty tomb. It was filled wall to wall, floor to ceiling with hope. With hope. An empty tomb represented a fulfilled hope and the omnipotent power of our, of, of, of our God, of our Father, of Jesus, the Holy Ghost, of God, an eternal God, and our faith in Jesus Christ. An empty tomb was proof that we can now possess a personal relationship with Jesus. Yes, even you. You don't know how bad I've been. I don't care how bad you've been. Jesus loves you, and his love for you is irresistible. That's what sent him to the cross. Oh, I'll do this because I love them. We often say, I'd take a bullet for so-and-so. What greater, what does the Bible say? What greater love hath a man than, than he give his life for his friends? Jesus said, hey, the song, the song, your, your life for mine. Your life for mine. I'll give my life. We are now priests uh, ourselves with no need of going through anybody else to get to Christ. We are children of God the Father. We are children of God the Father as believers. When you're without Christ, you're a creation uh, that he created for a specific purpose in this world. And he loves you dearly, but you're a creation. As a believer, as a person that takes the faith that God gave to you and gives it back to God and puts her faith in, in, in Jesus Christ as her Savior, you now become a child. That's what born again means. You must be born again. You've got to be born again into the family of God. Then you become a child. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. The, uh, this, the hope of an empty tomb is promised and gave us these things. We have a high priest in heaven that intercedes. What does that mean? Intercedes. It means that Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God today, and he, and he intercedes. He goes to God the Father on our behalf, pleading our cause. An empty tomb gave us these things. Gave, so the tomb was empty with the exception that it was filled with hope. We now have a, 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 living, a God that lives in us. God lives in our hearts in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. He lives in us to empower us, to inspire us, to guide us, to direct us, to help us fulfill the purpose for which we were created. We have a perfect copy of God's word to empower us and to guide us, lead us, and guide us to teach us the mind of God. God says, everything that you need to know about me, and look, one, one book cannot, cannot explain everything about God. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. But he says, everything that you will need to understand about me, I'm going to put it in a book for you. Why? Because Jesus Christ rose again. We have the wisdom of God for the asking. We have the rich history uh, in the Bible and seeing how God has responded to other people that have been in like situations or we have, as we are. And we've seen what God has, has done for them. We have a group of witnesses in heaven that are even watching. Yeah, even now, I believe, they watch down. And uh, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, uh, Hebrews tells us. Pulling for us, rooting for us as we run the race that God has set before us. We have God's angels to bring help and to help us uh, acting as the messengers from God to help us in times of need. We have God's wonderful attributes, all, all of those things that make God God, those are at our disposal. Everything that God is, is designed to help us. Because of the death, burial, and the resurrection. Because of an empty tomb. What does it mean to you this morning? What does the empty tomb, how does it affect, what kind of an effect does it have on your life today? In about 11 hours and 59 minutes, this day will, or, 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 or you know, it'll, it'll be noon tomorrow. That's 24 hours. It'll be midnight, and then we will begin another day. That's where I'm headed. 
It'll be midnight. Help me get there. And this day will be over. What will it have meant to you? Simply just, there's nothing, what's Easter? We had fun. Really? Is that really, do you think that's really the impact that God wants this day to have upon his children? It's another day, another Easter. I don't think so, and neither do you. What's holding you back from taking full advantage of a risen Savior? What's holding you back from taking advantage of a risen Savior today? Everything he has ever done was done for you. Jesus came to this earth because he loves you. Jesus spent 33 years on this earth because he loves you. Jesus was unjustly tried before the wicked Jews because he loves you. Jesus went to the cross because he loves you. Jesus was resurrected three days later because he loves you. Jesus is at the right hand of his Father right now, right now interceding for us because he loves us because he loves you what have you done with this knowledge in your christian life how has easter been how can easter ever be again not the not the not the easter and christmas uh, as we celebrate the birth of christ how do these not become the the the, the cornerstones of faith and hope. I have a piece of puzzle this morning. You can see it's a large, it's a large puzzle right there, let me tell you. It's about the size that I'm capable of doing. Figuring out. Now listen closely. For many people, for many believers, they have their whole life planned out. And Jesus is a piece of that puzzle. And maybe even before they became a believer, they had their whole life planned out. And then when they got Jesus, when they received Jesus and accepted the wonderful truth that Jesus died for you and he rose again for you, they say, oh, that's the part, that's the piece of the puzzle that I've been missing. I've got everything else planned out. And so they take the piece and they put it in. And they say, I'm ready to go. And you might say, well, what's wrong with that story? Well, there's nothing wrong with all of that story. Look, all of heaven rejoices when any person comes to Christ. But let me tell you what this Jesus peace really means. This Jesus peace really means this. I want you to take, I want you to take the puzzle that you've been working on. You've been banging pieces to fit together. <laughs> Yeah, that fits. It fits now. I want you to separate all the pieces. I want you to tear the puzzle up, separate the pieces, and I want you to take Jesus, and I want you to put him in the center, and then I want you to start to attach everything else in your life to that piece. That's what he really wants to do. He wants to give you a life that you could never imagine. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. We're always praying to God and saying, give me this. This is what I know I need. <clears throat> give me this. And God says, I, okay, I, 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 I see that and, and, uh, and I'll give you that because it's the best thing for you. But often God says, you're going to pray to me and please bring all your requests to me. But there are going to be times that I give you things that you don't have not even ever entered your mind. Great, wonderful things. Yeah, some tough times once in a while, yep, to make us, to work us, to file off the edges, the rough edges to help us grow and mature in grace. Jesus says, I, I, I am a peace, but I am the peace. I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, Father, but by me. I am the peace. You get me, you get me, and then you tear the rest of that puzzle up, and then you start attaching everything to me. 
That's when you will find the abundant Christian life. That's when you will find happiness like you've never known. That's when you will find peace like you've never known. That's when you will find comfort like you've never known. All of these things are made (coughs) available to us. Why? Because the empty tomb that looked empty was actually filled with hope of all the great things that God wants to do for you and me. The empty tomb is proof that Jesus is who he said he was. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As the song goes, uh, 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 you you are worthy or or thou art holy. I forget the name of it, but as the song goes, he is wonderful, glorious, holy, and righteous, victorious, comforter, triumphant and mighty, healer, deliverer, shield and defense, strong tower, and my best friend, omnipotent, omnipresent, soon coming king, soon coming king, I believe, the alpha and Omega, the Lord of everything. And he seeks you this morning. If you're unsaved, he seeks you. He's after you. To enter into a relationship with him. That you can take advantage of everything that he is and that he has. If you're saved this morning, he seeks us all this morning to draw closer. Why? We are reminded today because of an empty tomb that wasn't so empty. It was filled with hope. Let's pray.